He has also served in various delegations in Africa, as well as in European Union's headquarters in Brussels. Prior to his appointment to Trinidad and Tobago, he served as head of cooperation in the delegation of the EU to Zambia and Tunisia, where he was responsible for managing the development cooperation portfolios for Zambia and for the common market for Eastern and South Africa, Southern Africa. Ambassador Brisbane, who was born in the Netherlands, possesses a diploma in economy and law and enjoys sports such as golf, squash, and skiing. I now take this opportunity to welcome His Excellency Ambassador Ed Brisbane to the podium. Security, Mr. Stuart Young, Honorable Minister of Education, Ms. Anthony Garcia, Parliamentary Secretary, Mrs. Glenda Jennings Smith, Acting Commissioner of Prison, Mr. Dave Clark, Senior Government and Prison Officials, uh, colleagues from diplomatic missions, uh, Official Mission Chairman, Mr. Reynolds Cooper, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me a great pleasure to be here today and to celebrate with you uh, an important milestone of this project, which is the launch of the pre-release program by Vision on Mission. And the organizer had requested that I focus my brief presentation on the EU's contribution to Offender and VNG. The European Union delegation has supported the award of a direct grant to Vision on Mission to continue the work that the organization has been involved uh, with for many years, and it was already mentioned by Mr. Cooper. And the decision was made timely because one of the priorities of our, uh, our strategy to promote human rights and uh, democracy, which we have programmed for implementation uh, in Trinidad and Tobago between 2016 and 2020, is improving prison conditions and respect for prisoners' rights. The project is expected to expand Vision on Mission pre-release program. It's focusing on a post-release skills training incubator, which will hopefully lead to decrease in reoffending among the target groups. And again, it was already mentioned by Mr. Mr. Cooper. Um, the delegation is also supporting other initiatives to address the same issue. Specifically, we provided support for another local civil society organization, which is called Brown Cotton Organization to continue the work that they have been doing with the Outreach Masterclass program. A few weeks ago I visited the maximum security prison. Uh, I also visited the women prison as well as the youth training and rehabilitation center and I did that together with my colleagues uh, heads of mission from the member states. And the reason we visited is because we wanted to gauge the conditions in the prisons and to assess potential needs and that is in line with our objective to try and promote um, the, uh, prisons, uh, the prisoners' rights. And what we observed was that while the conditions were better than we expected, we also understand that severe challenges remain. And I name a few. Uh, we saw that uh, prolonged remand waiting times with limited access to rehabilitative uh, programs. We saw there's a lack of follow-up, of monitoring of released inmates to ensure their reintegration. We also saw long sentences for non-nationals for illegal entry or overstaying their, their visa. And clearly there's also the problems with gang affiliation. And the reason why we did it is to, to understand whether there's a possibility uh, for us to provide additional support in, in this area. Um, I also want to mention a regional project that uh, we have been developing initially here in Trinidad and Tobago. was taken over by our delegation in Barbados because it's a regional program. And it is intended to support the effective administration of criminal justice systems in the Caribbean. That program was recently approved and Trinidad and Tobago is uh, expected to be one of the benefiting uh, countries. It was developed in close collaboration with the authorities here. Uh, and the program is intended to support the country's uh, uh, judiciary reform agenda. And the impact of the project should contribute to a reduction in the pre-trial process, which would lead to significant improvements in the prison system as well. I think it primarily would be focusing and looking at the backlog that exists currently in, in the criminal justice system. 
and speed up the processing of, uh, of court cases. Um, going back to restorative justice, uh, the European Union is fully supportive of any attempts to promote uh, that system. As we are all aware, within the prisons, that entails a particular focus on the rehabilitation of prisoners and their reintegration into society. And the idea is also that when people are allowed to integrate fully in society, there's less recidivism, uh, there's less uh, falling back into criminal patterns. So not only assists with uh, providing opportunities for the persons concerned, it should also contribute to reducing criminality levels. Let me place on the record that in EU member states, prisons and prisoners by extension are faced with some of the same issues that prisoners are faced here in Trinidad and Tobago and around the world, such as overcrowding, living conditions, limited access to education and training, and that applies both for inmates and staff at times, and access to proper health care. What is different, however, is that the treatment of prisoners is, generally speaking, based on fundamental rights standards and broadly agreed criminal justice principles. And they point to the conclusion that imprisonment or criminal detention following a conviction should serve the goal of promoting the social reintegration of the sentenced person, thus helping to prevent reoffending, and that pre-trial detention should only be used exceptionally in full respect for the right to be presumed innocent until proven guilty. Uh, let me take this opportunity to share one example of best practice which proves that restoration and rehabilitation are really the best ways to counteract recidivism and effectively reintegrate prisoners into society. And that's the Norway example. Norway has had particular success with this approach, as the recidivism rate shows. Norway has a recidivism rate of 20% which is the lowest in Europe. And we can compare that to 50% in the United Kingdom, for instance, and 60% in the United States. Uh, and they have a total prison population of around 3,500 people, against a population of 5.3 million. Well, Norway's restorative justice starts with the tendency for few and short prison sentences. Those who look at longer sentences, a maximum of 21 years, get sent to restrictive, more conventional prisons. But the idea that prevails in Norway is that the deprivation of freedom is the punishment in itself. And within the prisons, the prisoners have the opportunity to work, earn money, socialize, educate and train themselves, and over the course of their sentence, they earn more and more freedoms. The prison system in Norway, uh, the objective is to prepare its prisoners gradually for life outside of prison, and for reintegrating into society. And throughout the course of their sentence, and that depends of course on the progress of their rehabilitation process, prisoners will gradually move to less restrictive institutions. But even the most restrictive institutions are careful to treat their inmates in the most humane uh, manner. And the idea that they have is that persons that are treated like animals will behave like animals. In closing, and I'm returning to the vision and mission, uh, vision on mission project, I and my colleagues in the delegation are excited about the prospects of this project. We are quite aware there's much work to be done, and let me therefore take this opportunity to publicly assure all the stakeholders that are represented here today of our continued commitment to partner with you all as we work together to address this, this and other development countries, the other, other development needs. Thank you very much. A couple of uh, organizations came to mind and we were particularly pleased with the work that Vision of Mission uh, was, was doing. Uh, they produced good results and an excellent reputation um, and they wanted to scale up their activities. So in a sense they were a natural partner. Um, and then a couple of weeks ago we organized a, uh, a dialogue on Prison condition of the restorative justice system together with the, with the Canadian High Commission uh, and uh, the, the Commission of Prisons uh, and, and civil society organizations. And we listened to testimonies of people who had served time uh, and who were supported by Vision or Mission. 
in being prepared for reintegration in society and also receiving support once they left uh, prison. And, and um, in, in a sense it was a heartbreaking testimony, but it was also heartwarming in the sense that because of the work that Vision on Mission was doing, this particular person effectively did manage to find a way to reintegrate into society, find a purpose in life, find a house to live, and find, and find a job. So it is a very small um, uh, step, it's one person, but it's a very clear indication of the positive impact that a program like Vision on Mission has on, on individuals. And if you expand it over many more individuals, it also has a bigger impact on society itself. Ambassador, earlier on you spoke about some of the challenges and some of the issues that exist, not just local but international. But what are some of the outcomes in terms of partnering with Vision on Mission on this particular project? Or what are some of the outcomes of the EU that they hope to accomplish at the end of this whole? Well, the, the, the objective, our contribution is relatively small. So uh, I think we need to be modest in our expectations. Um, but I think the idea is to, to try and help one promote uh, a dialogue on, on the discussions, uh, sorry, promote a dialogue on the uh, conditions uh, in the prisons, to promote a dialogue on what restorative justice means, uh, have a discussion with people, and, and try to help roll it out uh, on a very small scale from our perspective, but hopefully by showing that this is something that works, help create uh, dynamics for, for more initiatives of this kind. And, uh, and hopefully expand the, uh, these type of activities. Yes, and this is indeed a great partnership. And we thank you so much for being part of this 2019 launch preparation to release. And as you said, as small as the steps are, it can lead to greater things eventually. Thank you so much, Your Excellency Ambassador Ad Eastbrook, Head of Delegation of the EU to Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you so much for this discussion. You're welcome. and Minister in the Office of the Prime Minister. Prior to his appointment to the Government of Trinidad and Tobago, Minister Young has been a practicing attorney since 1998 and was admitted to the bar in Trinidad and Tobago, London, the Commonwealth of Dominica, and Antigua and Barbuda. A graduate of the University of Notting Hill, Nottingham, Minister Young has a wealth of experience in civil, commercial, banking, insurance, law, industrial relations, public law, and constitutional law, and election petitions. He has appeared as counsel in commissions of inquiry, including the Kyoto Commission of Inquiry. Minister Young is a sport enthusiast. That's why he was so easily walked in the streets of Port Spain. And he has competed in triathlons, has a black belt in Shokotan Karate, and has played many sports at competitive levels, including rugby and cricket. Without further delay, I now introduce the Honorable Minister Bashir. Good morning, good morning everyone. You all will allow me the indulgence of seeing all protocols observed. We are all aware who is here and I'm glad that we're all here this morning. Thank you very much for this opportunity and for this privilege to share a few thoughts with you here this morning. And I'd like to start by us just giving a hearty round of applause to Mr. Wien Chance, because I observe he's watching us live here, and to Mrs. Chance. Afterwards, I'm going to ask Wien how it is he was able to follow us live, because my phone is jammed, but his isn't. Vision on a Mission is doing tremendous work in the prison system and also in Trinidad and Tobago. It is something that came to my attention a few years ago and I've been following it very quietly and very closely. And I'd like to say as a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago, I thank everyone who supports Vision on a Mission and who supports the great and most important work that they're doing with not only our inmates, as I heard the prisons, prison officers here, and I've been observing them for some time now, their clients and customers, but also deportees and other troubled persons, who we categorize as troubled persons 
in society. I want to leave you all with a few thoughts here this morning. The first is this. No one can change the past. Not a single person I've met can change the past. Let's just park that thought there for a moment and I'll come back to it. I'd like to give some statistics that I read in my brief this morning. This program, the pre-release program, has 519 graduates for the year 2018. And over the life of this program, there have been 8,381 graduates in the program. Let's give them a round of applause. Because you see, what this program does is a very important and integral part of the prison system. I have been saying in the past few weeks, and I don't say things for lip service, I don't say things or do things for cosmetic value. It is because I truly believe it, that we should not forget that an integral and critical pillar, important part of the prison system, is rehabilitation. Because the second message is, we all make mistakes. So we can't change the past, we've made mistakes in life. So you're now in the system, we need to find a way to help with the rehabilitation. Because all should not be lost. So as you graduate here today, I stand here as a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago, and a proud citizen for you, the graduates. You've served your time, you've made mistakes in the past, but we, the society now, must find ways to welcome you back and allow you back into our society and to work with you as you reintegrate into society. And a program such as this is such an important part in restoring your confidence and helping you. Because for you to have made that mistake, it could have been a spur of the moment, it could have been that you chose a life of crime because you felt you had no other options. But you, the individual, have choices to make. We all have choices to make. As we wake up every morning, we make choices as we go through the day. And my vision for you my message to you here today as a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago, and then I guess somewhere back along it as a Minister of National Security, don't lose hope. We in society have a responsibility to you all, but whilst you're in the prison system, I thank the prison officers, I thank the programs like Vision on a Mission, I thank you, the EU delegation, and all of the other diplomatic services, corps, all of our other allied countries, that are playing an important part in resourcing us. Because you're not forgotten. And remember that, as I stand here on the 13th of March, 2019, I tell you as a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago, you in our prison systems are not forgotten. There is hope. Since assuming the office of Minister of National Security, as I was just reminded, on the 8th of August last year, it's only been about six months just going on seven months. And I've visited all of the prison systems except for the correctional facility that I plan to visit within the next week. I have walked in the remand yards and in the remand sections of all of our prisons in Trinidad and Tobago. And I want people to be aware of that. And the reason I did that, I didn't walk with the media, I didn't walk with any photographers, etc. It's because I wanted to see firsthand what it is that you are you're living in, what are your conditions, how we could improve it. And immediately after every single visit, I work with Mr. Sarah and Richards and his association, but also the Acting Commissioner of Prisons and the Executive, I go back to the Ministry and say it is unacceptable. We have to fix our remand facilities. And we're doing that because you deserve better. You are our citizens, and some of you may not be our citizens, but a country, one way of measuring a country is by its prison facilities. And I'll tell you all something. What I saw as a citizen in some instances disheartened me, depressed me, 
upset me, especially what I saw in Tobago. And the thing that for so long, so many administrations have left it that way, in my view as a citizen and as a Minister of National Security, I found it to be unacceptable. And immediately I set about telling the permanent secretaries of the Ministry of National Security, the Commissioner of Prisons, the, ex the, the association and its executives, we have to make it better. I don't make promises. That's one thing I've never done as a politician. I don't make promises because too many people make promises. They either can't fulfill it or they break it. There are only two things I've promised since 2014 when I entered this world of politics. One, to do my best, because that's within my control. And each and every one of you can make those choices as well. And two, it's not the only time that you will see me. I'll continue to do the best that I can. I want to call on corporate Trinidad and Tobago here this morning to join with the work we have an EU delegation, United States, Canada, Great Britain, United Kingdom, and other countries helping us. But our corporate citizens have a responsibility to help as well. And I'm pleased to say that quite a few of them have come forward because one of the greatest difficulties for inmates who have left the system is then to have the confidence of society in them and to hire them and to give them opportunities again in life. And I applaud and I thank all corporate citizens in Trinidad and Tobago who do that. I read in one of the daily newspapers this morning and they've been criticizing for the past few weeks, getting it wrong on most occasions. But the editorial today was saying, don't pay lip service. And I found it so ironic almost hypocritical because here you are saying don't pay lip service and I have just told you a little bit of what I have done since becoming Minister of National Security and I don't do any of that for praise or for recognition I do it because we have to better Trinidad and Tobago and our prison system is an integral and important part in Trinidad, of Trinidad and Tobago and if we don't provide for our prisoners and our inmates, our clients, and our customers. What are we saying to the rest of society? Because as I say, you can't change the past. So I can't change the past. I can't change what has happened before me as much as I wish I could. I can't change the spending patterns that have gone before me and have come into office now, struggling with a few pennies to try and stretch them to make the changes for the prison system to ensure that our prison officers and you, our inmates, have safe facilities, working facilities. I can't change the past and bring that money back. But what I can do is prioritize the spend going forward and make sure that we get value for money. It was shocking to me to see, and it was actually Acting Commissioner of Prisons, Mr. Clark, on one of my visits here, I've also been to YTC. I've walked through all of the various sections of YTC, spoke to all of our young men behind the cells in YTC. I made it my business to speak to as many of them as possible. Whoever were there on that day that I visited, I spoke to each and every one of them to get an understanding. And they're great success stories. Recently, as I was going to work at National Security, I saw it was around carnival time and I saw a lot of activity in Woodford Square and I saw prison vans parked up next to each other and the police there. When I got to the office I asked what's going on there and I was told that the prisoners were coming to have their Calypso Fiesta so to speak and to come into Woodford Square to sing and I made it my business to leave the office and to invite myself and to go there and hear the great talent. You all have also competed in the big contest recently and beat the persons you've come up against. Be proud! <laughs> so if persons are listening outside of these walls and they're listening on I-95 and other means and mediums, I stand here today as a citizen of Trinidad and today and I thank every single person 
who is working along with the prison system, vision on a mission, the prison officers, their families for supporting them, all of our various delegations in Trinidad and Tobago are offering their support. And I say, well done. And to you, the persons, the clients and customers in the system, know that there's hope. Know that you have our support. Know that you have the support of this government. And we will do whatever we can through me to make sure you have that support. I want to say this about lip service. And as I read that editorial today, saying don't come here and give lip service and I'll, as I've told you quite openly I don't give lip service and I don't do things with a cosmetic value I asked a question I said how many inmates who have left the system has that media house hired has that media house come into the system and worked along with any of the programs here the answer is no has that media house offered to give free newspapers to the prison system so the prisoners can read and keep current with what is going on. The answer is no. Has that media house offered to come and work on any of the programs going on here? The answer is no. But they sit in their armchairs in the comfort of their air conditioner, typing on a computer, preaching, telling us what to do. It will not deter me. I am here to work with you while I'm in office. I will do all that I can while I'm in office to help you. Another thing that I've done since coming into office is the Mercy Committee. Because walking through the yards of our prisons in Trinidad and Tobago, Mr. Richards was with me, Mr. Clark was with me, so many prisoners. I stopped and spoke to them, told me they're waiting to be pardoned. As soon as I got back to the ministry, I asked, what is that about? And immediately set about reading files. Every single prisoner who's asked for pardon, the file is about that big. Reading it from the back to the front, pushing it through the system. And I've asked the mercy committee that I chair, we need to meet more regularly because we need to try and clear this backlog. I stand here today to tell you and to deliver the message. We can't change the past. So the same way I can't change the past of what's happened before me, I can work on the present and I can do what I can for the future. Tobago. When I visited prison in Tobago, it is not fit to be called a prison. The prison officers who work there, I thank you as a citizen. Unfortunate inmates who are housed there, I don't know how you do it, but I tell you what, immediately upon leaving there, I turned to the permanent secretary <clears throat> and the acting commissioner of prison, Mr. Wilson and his team, and told them we have to fix this. When the prime minister was recently doing a tour of Tobago, we went to see the prospective site. It was not the right site. Immediately, having left that site in hope, we found the right site. Prime Minister has given me the approval. I've told you the court won't acquire that site and let us build proper facilities for our men and women in the system. I'm accustomed to being attacked. That won't stop. It won't deter me. It won't take away any of my sense of drive and energy to do what's right. When I ever I come to these facilities and I see that fence that's built outside there, and I am told that that fence costs us the taxpayers eighty million dollars, I get very, very angry. As I am telling you, as the Minister of National Security, if I were given that now, I would revolutionise the facilities that we have right now. How our prison officers are forced to live whilst they're here in the dormitories. It's a shame. The prison facilities for, for our inmates, yes, we're bettering it, but we can do better. So I want to tell you all today that none of this has gone past. 
I don't need to hear it from anyone. I don't like people to tell me stories of this is what is going on and that is what is going on. This is why I have made it my business to visit firsthand myself. And I've come back and I've come back and I'll come back again to make sure that the work is being done. There's very little I, as one individual, can do. But I stand here today and I tell the graduating class and I tell those who are to graduate and those who are in the system and the prison officers put their lives on the front line for us on a daily basis and deal with the risks that they deal with. You have my full commitment and I will do all that I, as a human being, one human being can do to improve the prison service system in Trinidad and Tobago whilst I serve in office. And it's a privilege to serve in office. And I will work with you, the prison officers, and the prisoners in our system to make it better. I thank you all for the opportunity. Don't lose hope. Vision on a mission. This is chance. Waiting, watching on on the phone that I can't understand how you're getting service. Thank you. Thank you for all that you do. You have the full support of this government. The few pennies that we have, we will make it stretch to keep the work that you're doing going. And I thank everyone for allowing me the opportunity to, to change the schedule a little bit because I wanted to talk a little earlier because unfortunately I'll have to slip away in a little while to go to the other duties. You are an important part of our society and we will do all that we can. Another thing, as the Minister of Communication, I end by saying this, the library services, NALIS, fall under me as the Minister of Communication. I was opening a library facility in Ibiza a few weeks ago and I turned to the chairman of NALIS and actually texted him the night before. And I said, what's going on with the library system in our prison system? The library services in our prison system. And I've told him I want that prior to rise. I want our prison systems, YETC, Women Facility, Port of Spain, Golden Grove, maximum security. We must have facilities here for you to broaden your thinking. So that is a priority coming out of the Ministry of Communication. I've told them I want that pushed high up the ladder. That is how important I view the prison system of Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you very much for your attention here today. Thank you for the opportunity to address you. Do not give up hope. We will work with you on restoration, rehabilitation, and reintegration into society. And I will do all that I can to help you along that journey. Thank you very much. I forgot about the coach. Thank you very much, Minister, Honourable Minister. And I think you can hear the sincerity. And um, we certainly, as Vision and Mission, by intake, and I'm sure the prison union, um, officers union, and prison management, and everyone present here today could relate to the need for the improvements that Minister Young has shared with us. And we certainly thank him for giving us what in the in, in line with the theme, some keys to success um, for the whole prison system in Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you very much, Minister. And now over to his discussion with Ms. Gibbs on the couch. You know what's difficult this time around? The Minister has said everything in his future address and he totally knocked all my questions out. So at least... Good. <laughs> So your visit will be both very short. So you spoke on your views, and in fact the views of the Ministry on restorative justice. You also spoke about the importance of second chances and to touch on choice, which is something that sometimes we don't pay attention to, that we all have that ability to choose and make the right choice. But if you can just touch, and you also talked about corporate society and their involvement, or their involvement that should happen. What is, what is your, your take on the Ministry's position, in fact, on the re-entry and the relevance of the NGOs such as Vision on Mission, Mission sorry, in providing such services? The NGOs, especially NGOs that work in our prison system, are invaluable. Work, as I said, 
I hope it came across clearly. The vision on a mission, the work that they're doing, is worthy of the highest awards. But there are also other NGOs. I've been doing a little homework behind the scenes. And each of them plays an important part. The adult literacy services, ACLA, and the work that they're doing coming into our prison system to give the second chance. Because not everyone has all of the opportunities in life. Just because you end up in prison doesn't mean that you're a bad person. It could have been wrong choices, misguided. So we need to provide the tools while in prison. I'll tell you something, at YTC when I visited, there was a young man there, he's no longer a young man. And he was in the computer section. And if you see the artwork that he has done, the freehand drawing, what he's done on the computers, and they told me he is now tutoring. He's also tutoring, if I remember correctly, helping with the music and then how they use the computers, etc. The graphic art. It was amazing. And to see that and to be given the opportunity, and he takes pleasure now in teaching the young boys. There was a heartbreaking, and allow me to drift very briefly, there was a heartbreaking interaction I had at YTC. This is why it's so important that we give persons a second chance. And when you're in the system that we work towards rehabilitation, there was this young, young boy. So in every dormitory, there are a number of, of young men. And when I, uh, I kept asking them, how old are you? What is your name? Why are you here? This young boy, when I asked him, he dropped his head. He's 13 years old. And I could see a sense of remorse. The officer taking me around then told me, when this young boy came in, he did not even know, or he did not think what he had done was wrong. He was incarcerated for selling narcotics at a school. His story is that he needed, when he, he went to his father's home, the person staying there told him, if you want to earn money to get food to eat, just take this to school and sell it. When he came in, the, the prison officers told me he was big and he was bad and he could take on the world. But they worked with him over time and started teaching him. One of the speakers before me spoke about teaching right from wrong. That simple lesson he learned of what is right and what is wrong. He's now filled with remorse. He's going through his rehabilitation. And those are the successes of our system that the public don't hear about. And that is why it's important that we in society give the second chance and work along with those who have found themselves in these unfortunate circumstances. Honorable Minister, you just took my next question away from me. <laughs> I was just going to ask you to speak to society because you're speaking to the NGOs as well, you're speaking to corporate, and even here within the system here. But I think as a citizen, someone in the general public, there must be something what we need to do in, in terms of not just judging these persons when they come back out, giving that opportunity. You can speak to that, and that's really my final question. Because you may throw something in it there as well. It's difficult, because the stigma of crime affects all of our citizens. They say crime is one of the biggest issues facing the country, and they're right. So immediately, our persons who have been rehabilitated and are coming back out into society, are facing a disadvantage. I, I would be lying if I said prior to these experiences I wouldn't have approached someone with a criminal record with a bit of apprehension. But as I say, we all make mistakes. We can't change the past. Everyone deserves a second chance. All I ask of you is making most of that second chance. And I'll end by saying this. To those who are going back to be reintegrated into society, this graduating class, you are now role models. As you go back to your communities, preach the message. Tell the young people that a life of crime is not the way to go. It's not easy. It's not easy for anyone. Don't look at me and say, well, it's not easy for the minister or the minister of education, the prime minister, anyone. So I can tell you, I can't remember when last I've slept. And it's just lying awake at night trying to figure out how to better turn that into people, how we're going to deal with certain things. As the Minister of National Security, you're constantly getting reports about crimes that have been committed. 
So I ask of you as you graduate and as you go back, you are now our biggest advocates for life against crime. Go and talk to the young people, talk to persons in society, tell them it's not the right choice. There are options. Corporate Trinidad and Tobago, the rest of us, we have a responsibility and a duty to find the 